Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webcast covering TBR's Network Infrastructure Services Research Highlights and Webcast. My name is Allison Crawford, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Over the past year, we have engaged with our readers through our quarterly webinars to provide you with additional insight into the state of the networking and mobility market. We have questions and discussions with you, and we're excited to continue to connect you as the MP practice grows. Before I hand this over to Scott, there are a few action items I'd like to cover with you. First, we'll be recording today's session and posting it on our YouTube site, TRI Channel. We encourage you to visit our channel to watch this presentation or any of the others that we've posted. Second, we'd like to hear your opinions and thoughts on the materials we're presenting. Please send any questions or comments to the Q&A or chat function. Scott will address them at the end of the presentation. Or, if you'd like to set up a client inquiry for more detailed discussion, please reach out directly to Scott at the end of the webinar to set up that discussion. Send out the slides to everyone registered for today's webinar within 24 hours of the conclusion of the presentation. You can also find these slides, as well as other thought leadership pieces, other webinar decks, and commentaries on SlideShare at www.slideshare.net backslash tbr underscore market underscore insight. Now let me introduce Scott Dennehy, Senior Analyst on the Network and mobility team here at TBR. He's been working in the network infrastructure services space for the past 15 years and is leading research coverage at NIS. Sending TBR in 2010, Scott's insight has helped our clients improve their strategic go-to-market plans and market position. And with that, let me hand this over to Scott. Hey, Allison, and, and welcome, everybody. Uh, very interesting uh, last six months or so in the networking space. Um, particularly in, in the services area. Uh, a lot of different uh, themes and, and market trends uh, out there, but I'd like to really focus on three key ones um, that are going to really be permeated throughout the discussion that we have today, uh, how they impact not only supplier results for the, the third quarter, but how they're going to impact supplier uh, results and, and their strategies moving forward. Uh, first and foremost, uh, when it, in terms of the, the overall NIS market, uh, we saw growth decelerate in, in the third quarter uh, amongst the benchmark companies that we look at. Um, average supplier year-to-year growth in the third quarter was about 5.5%, uh, down from about 10.5% in the second quarter. Uh, and a lot of that has been driven by the economic uncertainty that remains in, in developed markets like the U.S. and Europe, and the impact that that uncertainty is having on enterprise IT budgets. In general, uh, enterprises spend more on maintenance services and, and what I'll call short-term run-the-business type projects uh, rather than the longer-term change the business engagement that can really provide the revenue of volume that suppliers need to drive growth. In fact, half of the total revenue generated by suppliers was uh, came from maintenance services in the third quarter. So as a result of, of that uncertainty in some of these developed markets, the suppliers are turning towards the emerging markets to drive their growth. Uh, and specific countries that are, are seeing the strongest, strongest growth include Russia, China, Brazil, and Mexico. And this is a trend we expect to continue as we move through 2013. Now, the thing that, uh, uh, that we've been keeping track of over the last six months or so is the emergence of software-defined networking and the impact that it's having in the networking space. Um, there's been a DN over the last six months or so around supply acquisitions, around suppliers uh, outlining their SDN strategies, uh, and we believe that that trend is going to continue into 2013. Now, what that means from a services perspective is that initially that's going to create some opportunities for vendors in uh, services like consulting, as enterprise customers will be looking to their suppliers to help get guidance on uh, the right SDN architecture uh, for their environment. So from a supplier perspective, what that means is, is companies with very strong services businesses like AD, Dell, IBM, Accenture are going to be well positioned, particularly early on as they leverage their consulting expertise to get in with, with clients and start talking to them about SDN. Uh, we expect that the uh, equipment vendors, so companies like Cisco and Juniper, uh, they will also start to build out their uh, SDN-related portfolios uh, make sure that the implementations that uh, their customers are doing um, are successful. So uh, the third quarter results, I just want to touch briefly on the NIS benchmark coverage 
uh, to make sure it's clear on, on what specifically we look at. Uh, from a technologies perspective, uh, you see the, the different network technologies listed there. Uh, I think it's more important to out what we don't look at uh, if you look at things from an overall IT perspective. So we don't look at services around things like servers and storage. We don't look at uh, services around things like endpoint devices like P PCs and laptops and, and uh, mobile devices, nor do we look at services around enterprise software, whether that's productivity software, uh, CRM type software, those kinds of things. So 11 suppliers are a good mix of equipment vendors like Cisco, Juniper, Huawei, uh, and your traditional IT services firms like HP, IBM, and Accenture. Uh, four main service segments, and you see some of the specific professional ca uh, services categories listed there, uh, and four geographic segments. Those of you who have been on the webinar previously might uh, recognize this slide, and what this does is provides a, uh, a visual representation of the 11 suppliers in the benchmark and how their strategies in NIS differ. On the left-hand side of the arrow there, you see the, your, your equipment suppliers like Cisco and Juniper and Way, and on the right-hand side, your IT services firms. And uh, depending on where you sit uh, on this, along this arrow really determines what the strategy is. Uh, on the left-hand side with the equipment suppliers, by and large, the strategy is about leading with product and then attaching services along uh, with that product sale. So as a result, their revenue mix tends to be uh, more heavily weighted towards things like maintenance services. So the services firms take the opposite approach. It's about leading with services and services engagements and then attaching and bringing that product along as needed. And you might expect their, their revenue mix tends to be weighted more towards professional and managed services. What's been interesting to watch over the last several months is, is kind of how these um, firms are altering their strategies, particularly the equipment suppliers. Uh, when we did this, uh, our 2011 benchmark in the fall, um, both sides of the arrow were more, a little more clustered on the ends. You had the equipment supplier a little bit more closely tied together on the left-hand side and, and ditto for the uh, IT services firms. But the strategy are starting to evolve where you're seeing a lot of these equipment suppliers now, now start to evolve into more like services uh, companies. Uh, I and Siemens are two very good examples of that. In fact, uh, about half of their revenue, now, of their total company revenue, now comes from services. And we're seeing um, their strategies evolve and to more lead with a services type of approach, as you might expect from, from an IT services firms. And we're even seeing that with some of uh, your traditional equipment suppliers like Cisco and Huawei, and this is something we expect to continue as companies start to shift away from that hardware-centric model and focus more on software and services for their, their long-term revenue growth. So we to the three uh, Q12 results, uh, and just uh, uh, here on how to, to read this, the chart that you see here, you're going to see quite a few of these as I go through. Uh, what you have on the uh, vertical axis there is your year-to-year -year revenue growth, and, and on the horizontal axis, the total revenue, and then the size of the bubbles there are an indicator of, of the total revenues, just to give you a better visual idea of how these suppliers compare to each other in terms of their total revenue. First, at uh, total NIS revenue, um, I mentioned earlier about maintenance services being a big driver in, in terms of total revenue for the third quarter. As you might expect, a lot of the equipment vendors saw the strongest growth, companies like Cisco and Juniper and Huawei as they attach those maintenance services onto those product sales or uh, drive uh, long-term or, or um, multi-year maintenance contracts to help their customers reduce costs. Um, from the perspective, Huawei was the growth leader. A lot of it was driven by their continued aggressive focus on the enterprise segment. Um, that will probably slow as, as we move into 2013 here. In fact, based on what the company reported a few a couple of months ago in terms of their preliminary results, uh, their enterprise they're not going to meet their original stated enterprise growth goals, but still a very healthy growth at about 30 plus percent. Point out a, a, a couple of changes in strategy, uh, particularly HP's perspective. Uh, HP has made a decision that they're going to move their technical services or TS organization, which has a lot of their maintenance consulting services in with their uh, product group, the uh, Enterprise Service Storage and Networking Group, or ESSN, where uh, previously that was a separate organization that lived within HP services. And that's helped HP drive more sales of, of or drive product attached sales of, of maintenance and consulting and systems integration services, like your traditional 
um, vendors do. Moving margin, uh, based on the, the uh, performance of equipment suppliers and specifically around maintenance services, um, as you might expect, they had some of the best margins of all the suppliers uh, as those maintenance um, services, particularly from um, the standpoint of companies like Cisco and Juniper, carry very high margins along with them. However, that's not necessarily always the case. You can see some companies here that, that are maybe in different spots than you might expect. Uh, Infosys is a good example of that. They were the second highest in terms of their operating margin as a, an IT systems integrator, which is a little bit counterintuitive. Uh, the reason for that is, is their focus on very high-end, high-margin type opportunities. Their overall mass revenue is very low, but margins are high because they're focusing on those specific high-margin opportunities uh, to let them keep those, those high operating margins. Now, um, based on a shift in their strategy, specifically around their growth initiative, which is called uh, Infosys 3.0, and some other changes they're making in terms of, of wage hikes, um, their margins could dip somewhat in 2013, although we expect to uh, have them still remain amongst the top uh, in, the, in the NIS benchmark in terms of operating margin. On the side, you have Huawei, which is down near the bottom in terms of operating margin, and they almost take the opposite strategy as Infosys. They're really concerned with gaining share at this point rather than gaining margin. So they'll take pretty much any opportunity they can get their hands on regardless of the margin profile to try to gain um, accounts and grow from there. This is a, a strategy that they've used very successfully in the telecom segment uh, and something that we expect them to continue to do uh, in the enterprise as well. For the individual segments that we look at first on maintenance, uh, party about um, maintenance in terms of, of how much it, it was a driver of, of revenue for uh, for the, the benchmark suppliers in the third quarter. Um, it was still the, it was however the slowest growing segment. Uh, average growth for average year to year growth for suppliers and maintenance was about four percent. Still a nice steady and dependable revenue stream for equipment vendors like So Juniper, Via, and the rest. Uh, as uh, average, these suppliers got about 59, 59% of their revenue or NIS revenue from maintenance during the third quarter. Now, this is becoming a, um, or, or a convert, if you look at the IT services firms, that number is down to about 22% for some of the, man the, the reason I mentioned earlier in terms of their, their strategy for leading professional and managed services. Now, they become more commoditized, uh, and what the suppliers are doing to, to try to help Act that is building out their capabilities beyond simple break fist fix type services. So adding more proactive maintenance services, things like um, dedicated uh, service managers, and and those things that can that can really add value to the maintenance services rather than just troubleshooting and, and basic break fix. Uh, what we're also seeing is suppliers tying those maintenance services to, to higher value services like managing services to help increase the overall value for their client base. Uh, so this is a, is a very good example of a, of a company that's doing this successfully. Uh, at the leaders in terms of revenue and revenue growth, as you might expect, Cisco is the, the overwhelming leader in terms of overall revenue. Um, in fact, uh, their growth rate was high in the third quarter, and it was uh, their maintenance service growth was double that of their product growth, uh, which is catered that customer prioritizing their budgets away from hardware and more towards keeping their existing infrastructure up and running uh, through maintenance services. It was the growth leader. Um, most of this was due to the, the expansion of the enterprise uh, portfolio that we've seen from them and attaching the maintenance services onto the, the sales of those enterprise products. Um, their services portfolio is limited compared to some of the more established vendors like Cisco and Juniper. Um, we expect them to build out their portfolio in this area to try to better compete and look at other areas that some of these other vendors may not be looking to address, like multi-vendor maintenance. On to services, deployment is the lowest in terms of overall revenue compared to the other segments that we look at. Uh, only a, an average of about 6% of, of total supplier NA revenue came from deployment services. And a big reason for this is deployment is, is an area where, by and large, suppliers focus more on their higher-end opportunities 
and new technologies like data center and cloud uh, security. Um, what this allows them to do is to dry, keep those margins high, particularly in the case of equipment suppliers like Cisco and Juniper, it, it enables them to avoid conflict. Um, their partners typically rely a lot on more basic or lower margin installation and limitation services for the vast majority of their revenue. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Huawei, uh, this is deploying certainly an area where they are, you're going to see their strategy as far as taking those low margin opportunities start to take hold. Um, if they continue to build out their product portfolio, they're going to look to drive that re revenue growth and deployment as they focus more on the end-to-end -end solutions. But again, margin is not really a, primera, a primary focus for them, so they'll take some of those lower-end opportunities, even if it means stepping on the toes of their partners every once in a while. Now, this is definitely an area where SDN will have an impact as we move into 2013, uh, particularly as uh, supply and companies start to roll out their SDN offerings and these products actually start to get purchased and implemented. Customers will turn to their suppliers to help them deploy solutions and make sure that um, they get up and running. Moving services, uh, what we found in the third quarter for professional services is demand uh, to develop markets was, was centered more on things like cost reduction and operational efficiency. So again, I talked about earlier, those kind of change the business type engagements, longer term engagements, we really didn't see a lot of those in the third quarter as customers were more interested in keeping their costs low and trying to, to gain efficiencies to help drive those costs down. That's where a lot of the revenue in, in, in uh, professional services came from in the third quarter. We expect that to remain the case for at least the, the next couple of quarters uh, until the thing environment, particularly in places like the U.S. and Europe, starts to get a little bit better. Long term, uh, the group is going to come from those consulting and systems integration services that enable these enterprises to implement some of these more uh, emerging technologies like uh, cloud, mobile, and again, SDN, definitely one of those um, tech that is going to drive long-term growth uh, in professional services. Now, some of the specific vendors, um, no surprise that you see Accenture there in terms of their overall uh, revenue lead. So this actually closed the gap a little bit in, uh, in the third quarter, a lot of based on the fact that the, um, they just based on the sheer volume of revenue that they do in NIS. That's only about 20% of their total NIS revenue comes from professional services, but because that big number is so high, they're seeing that number two spot. And the, the growth here in, in professional services, for some of the same reasons we've talked about, taking those low-end opportunities to establish its, its um, presence in some of these enterprise accounts, and then building out those higher-value offerings from there to grow revenue and margins. Managed services. So managed services was the highest growing segment uh, of the four that we look at in NIS from a, a, the supply average. A little over 10% year to year growth amongst the suppliers, uh, primarily by enterprises investing in out managed services to help them reduce costs and the growing network complexity. It was much more a comfort from enterprise customers in turning keys to a vendor that can manage. Uh, their network infrastructure, um, not only providing those cost benefits, but again, just supplying things for them so that they don't have to deal with this increasing network complexity with all these new technologies and all these new uh, vendors that are being implemented. So, to that, we expect that managed services will become a, a bit more of a, a larger portion of revenue for all of, of NOS suppliers, including many equipment vendors and, and Company of I and Siemens come to mind based on what they're doing in, in managed services in terms of the, the portfolio expansion and some of the other things that they're doing. Uh, you might expect the IT services firms really dominated uh, in managed services as they're able to execute on their strategy of, of leading with those high value consulting and systems integration services, which lead to those managed services opportunities. Now, specifically, uh, we expect their outsourcing and managed services services to grow at a higher rate than their professional services in 2013, mostly due to that weak demand for consulting and systems integration in the developed markets that they play in. Perspective, it's really about their scale and, and their ability to win those lar large long-term outsourcing contracts uh, that's really going to help drive their revenue. Uh, example is a 10-year 
a million dollar IT outsourcing contract that they won in July uh, from a company called CMEX. Always the, the growth leader. Um, and while we have some experience in managed services on the telco side that they can leverage in managed services, particularly delivering things like monitoring and outsourcing services remotely from the network operation centers it has in low cost regions, but the company's still going to need to build out their capabilities in enterprises as their current capability sharing those centers with their telco customers may be a little bit too limiting for some of their larger enterprise customers. So we expect them to continue to invest in those kinds of um, capabilities. Uh, a regional view of, of NS. Uh, see here is the the four regions we look at and the three Q12 results in terms of, of revenue growth and, and overall revenue. So North America was the, the largest in terms of overall revenue, but was second in terms of year growth at about 3.5%. Uh, I talked at the beginning about the uncertainty in developed markets like the U.S. Uh, and in the U.S. specifically, a lot of the uncertainty was driven by uh, things like the fiscal cliff and the presidential election and the impact that the election was going to have on on public policy and tax reform and those kinds of things. Now, that uncertainty did have a, a bit of a, a larger impact on product sales uh, as um, those flyers that were able to generate growth in North America did that by focusing on those uh, long-term maintenance and managed, managed services contracts to give uh, their customers cost savings over the, over the life of that contract. It was, was uh, your growth leader in North America, although that's a little bit deceiving because they come from such a very small base, less than a million dollars in NIS revenue in 3Q12. Uh, in fact, uh, we do expect that growth to slow as we move through 2013, particularly as um, many of you have seen in October the report by the U.S. House Intelligence Committee that said um, they believe that Huawei's networking equipment posed a significant risk to national security. So that's really going to increase the um, nervousness of customers to deploy Huawei gear, deploy Huawei gear in their networks, and as a result, the, their NS revenue is going to suffer. Uh, EMEA did uh, grow in terms of their overall revenue, 2.7%, uh, uh, mostly due to demand in emerging countries, offsetting the declines in, in Europe due to the weak spending environment. However, as you can see, EMEA was the lowest of the four regions in terms of their overall growth. Um, the French vendors like Accenture and IBM and, and Siemens were hit the hardest by the emerging purchasing delays as they have the, the biggest install base uh, of customers in Europe, uh, particularly in the case of Accenture and, and Siemens uh, being based there. Now, what leaders like Cisco and Huawei were able to do was leverage their distribution and their other partnerships in, in those emerging countries, Russia, to drive some of their growth in, uh, in NIS in that region. So uh, APAC was the highest uh, growth country, about 9.5% year to year. In fact, none of the 11 suppliers that we look at um, grew their revenue in APAC in the third quarter, which was the most of any of the regions. The customer demand here is being driven around network infrastructure modernization, particularly in, in high growth countries like um, China and India. And this is a trend that we expect to continue as we move through 2013, demand for things like cloud services will require these enterprise customers to invest in additional network upgrades to make sure that uh, they can meet the performance and security requirements that they need. Uh, Central and Latin America are the smallest in terms of, of overall revenue, uh, but in, in revenue growth. And I mentioned at the beginning that um, the shift in, in our strategy or the shift from developed markets to emerging markets and, and Central and Latin America is a really good example of that, as particularly as the, the environment in North, North America remains unpredictable, seeing some start to move and invest in Central and Latin America, uh, companies like Brazil and Mexico and Peru uh, to try to drive some of the NIS revenue growth while the spending environment uh, just north remains a little bit weak. And uh, that are best positioned here are companies like IBM and HP, that leverage their scale and their need to uh, expand into some of these high growth markets. So now that I've covered uh, the results and the market trends for 
the, the third quarter 12 in, in network infrastructure services. I just want to end by highlighting the ongoing coverage that TBR has in the space and, and specifically our, our quarterly syndicated NIS benchmark. Um, what uh, the NIS benchmark is designed to do, much like uh, a lot of other uh, TBR uh, benchmarks, is to provide that comprehensive view of the market, both from a, a current and historical um, perspective which enables our customers to make more informed decisions around things like services, strategies, and tactics, and, and growing their market share. And we do by identify, identifying the leaders and strategies, growth opportunities in IS um, that could help uh, our customers, uh, again, gain that share and, and hold off their competitors. Now, perspective, as I mentioned at the beginning, we cover 11 suppliers in four services segments and four geographies. Uh, we highlight things like quality revenue, growth, margins, town and geographic data, uh, as well as analyze the top suppliers in each service category and region and provide that, that necessary insight into event strategies and, and some of the market trends that, uh, like we talked about here today. So we'll Allison for questions. Great. Uh, thanks, Scott. We've got a couple questions that have come in so far. I'd like to encourage anyone out there, if you have any questions, uh, to send them through now. Uh, the first question we got, Scott, do you foresee any equipment vendors making a services acquisition to expand into professional and managed services? Uh, that is, is probably no. Um, and, and think about what HP has done with their EDS acquisition, and I think about what Dell has done with the Perot Systems acquisition and kind of uh, a captive services firm. Um, to do that, I think we talked a little bit about in reference to Cisco, particularly based on some of the comments that um, their so John Chambers made recently around becoming the world's largest IT company, and people start to think of how they might do that. And services is certainly an area where they they could go into, and they certainly have the resources to do that. Um, but I think the impact of making a large, particularly a large services acquisition by an equipment vendor, the impact that that's going to have on margins. The impact that that's going to have on their channel presence, um, I think that the, whisk, the risks really outweigh the benefits in that case. Um, I think that if any companies were to do it, they would be more of the, the more the services focused type companies uh, like Via, like a Siemens. And in that case, I think the, the acquisitions would be very targeted within specific segments rather than a, a very large acquisition. Um, the question we got next. Uh, could you talk a bit more about the impact of SDN on the services market? Um, so, about at the beginning, I think initially uh, there's we still got a, a while, a ways to go here before you actually start to see revenue generate a lot of revenue generated with SDN and, and even companies like Cisco and Juniper. They're really just rolling out their strategies and, and really not going to start to see product in. Uh, a company significant way until late this year, uh, and I expect the 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 services adoption curve to kind of be very similar to what you see in other emerging technologies. Kind of that that big bell curve where you have the phases around can, and proof of concept, and then gradually as as customers start to go into that deployment phase, that's really where a lot of the revenue is going to come from. As a lot of the solutions get implemented and designed. And then on the blend of that is, is when you start to move from the deployment phase into the maintenance and, and the management phase. I think SDN is really going to follow that similar tact. Um, and earlier that we expect to see some suppliers start to roll out SDN-specific services. And we've already had a little bit of HP uh, in Europe in October of just a few uh, SDN-specific services, proof of concept being one of them, and have kind of laid out a roadmap. Um, for future services in the areas of, of things like consulting, implementation, and maintenance. So we expect, as I mentioned, a lot of the other suppliers to follow suit. Um, and I think the suppliers that are going to be the most successful are the ones that are able to roll out those services and, and get in early some of these customers from a consulting standpoint and start to grow into into the, the areas of deployment and managed and maintenance services uh, at adoption curve really starts to ramp up. Looks like questions in queue, uh, so we'll talk really slow in case someone does want to want to send it through. Uh, in the meantime, I want to thank you, Scott, for your time, and thanks everyone for joining us today and sending across your questions. Um, you can follow. Both
Scott and TR on the Twitter handles listed here. And we check out our SlideShare and YouTube pages that are also listed. And we'd like to encourage you to join our LinkedIn group uh, for more information about the things that TBR is working on. Before we sign off, I'd like to request that you take a brief survey about today's webinar. We'd like to get your feedback in terms of the quality of the content as well as the presenter, which we'll be using to improve our presentations quarter to quarter. I'm going to leave the chat function open for another few minutes in case there's any last minute questions or comments. If we don't hear from you guys, we look forward to seeing you guys all again next quarter. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you.